History as it happens, December 5th, 2023. Diplomat, intellectual, war criminal? I think the word war criminal should not be thrown around in the domestic debate. Nixon and Mr. Kissinger unleashed 100,000 tons of bombs, the equivalent of five Hiroshima's. By common agreement between us and the North Vietnamese, we are today... The city of Saigon was renamed today. The victorious communists who forced the city's surrender said the capital of South there Vietnam... There is no country in the world where it is conceivable that a man of my origins could be standing here next to the President of the United States. There was no policy to assassinate, to assassinate any foreign official. When you're in this job, you're not conscious of working with the most powerful man in the world. You're much more conscious of the problems that have to be solved than of the power you exercise. Because I happen to believe that Henry Kissinger was one of the most destructive secretaries of state in the modern history of this country. I am proud to say that Henry Kissinger is not my friend. Henry Kissinger was one of the most influential diplomats and foreign policy thinkers of the American century. Admired for his achievements, despised by those who see a war criminal fetid by the establishment. Kissinger was considered a realist, a master practitioner of real politic, but he held the same basic assumption or illusion shared by most American diplomats, that the world needs U.S. leadership to avert disaster. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. And his argument is not that the United States has some utopian solution for the Middle East, but that we're the best possible mediator of all those that might be there. That's what he says to Mao Zedong also, that we're better than the Soviets. Wouldn't you rather have a partnership with us than the Soviets? So it's a belief in the essential role of American power in preventing the world from reliving apocalypses that he himself has witnessed. The president decided that we could not engage in a charade with the American people. And we are now in this curious position. December 16th, 1972. Henry Kissinger holds a news conference to update reporters on snags in the ongoing negotiations to bring U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War to a close. To settle the remaining issues in terms that two weeks previously they had already agreed to. So we are not talking about this is barely two months after Kissinger announced a major breakthrough in his negotiations with North Vietnam's Le Duc Tho. That announcement came in October, before the presidential election. Kissinger and Tho would both be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973. Nothing that we have done has meant more than attempting to bring an end to the war in Vietnam. What the public did not know was what Kissinger and Nixon really thought about their phony stage-managed peace talks. Expressed in a private conversation August 1972, recorded on Nixon's secret White House taping system, Kissinger did not know at the time he was being recorded. South Vietnam probably is never going to survive anyway, says Nixon. We have to realize, Henry, that winning an election is terribly important. Winning an election is terribly important. Terribly important this year. It's terribly important this year, but can we have a viable foreign policy if a year from now or two years from now, North Vietnam gobbles up South Vietnam? Can we have a viable foreign policy if a year from now? Kissinger responds, we've got to find some formula that holds the thing together a year or two. After a year, Mr. President, Vietnam will be a backwater. If we settle it, say, this October, by January 74, no one will give a damn. We've got to find some formula that holds the thing together a year or two. After which, after a year, Mr. President, Vietnam will be a backwater. If we settle it, say, this October by January 74, no one will give a damn. 
Nixon and Kissinger's decent interval lasted two years until April 1975. Saigon fell to the communists, and I go over all of this in detail in an episode titled A Decent Interval from earlier this year. Also, back in May, I did an episode titled Kissinger and Cambodia, where I discussed the secret bombing of that country by the U.S. that began shortly after Nixon took office in 1969, an atrocity that killed thousands of civilians. So was Henry Kissinger a realist or a militarist? How should we weigh his significant achievements against his record of supporting dictatorships in the global south? For instance, the Suharto regime in Indonesia as it crushed an independence movement in East Timor, a horrible episode that is often overlooked today. It took place when Gerald Ford was president. Now, we're not going to get into all of these here. For instance, if you're interested in Kissinger's role in Allende's demise in Chile, look for an episode I did a couple months back titled Chile's Coup. Today, we're going to focus on ideas. Why was Kissinger so important to the foreign policy establishment for decades after he left government until his death last month at the age of 100? What did he symbolize for them? And for as many critics, why did they so vehemently denounce him? Maybe it comes down to an idea that we're still debating today, as multiple horrors unfold across the world. And that idea is the world needs U.S. leadership, even if it means doing business with dictators or dropping bombs on civilians. Because this argument goes, the alternative would be worse for humanity. Now, I do not subscribe to this view, but it did drive Kissinger. Jeremy Surrey is a historian at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He resides at the intersection of contemporary politics and foreign policy. He hosts This Is Democracy podcast and is the author of Henry Kissinger and the American Century. Jeremy Surrey, welcome back. Good to be with you as always, Martin. So you've done how many? 17, 18 media interviews? How many? They're about, yeah, 17, I think. That's amazing. I mean, they were you... all practice for talking to you. They were just the, the warm ups. <laughs> I mean, how many different media organizations? Well, they're all looking for someone who's written a book on Kissinger, as you have, right? So basically, one after another, you hung up the phone and picked up the next line. And <laughs> yeah, I started with uh, Morning Edition on National Public Radio, which I have to say is one of my favorite shows. I started with them at five thirty a.m. and they kept replaying that and then uh it was like cbs morning news it just went one to the next i you know people just kept contacting me while i was on the prior call and there were like three or four hours i didn't leave my office i just went from one interview to another did you repeat the same answer in every single one <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was consistent, yeah. but what's interesting and relevant for our discussion today is that different questions were asked, and, and I also found that different interviewers knew different things about Kissinger. There were some interviewers who knew a lot about foreign policy and asked a lot about that. There were some who thought a lot and asked a lot about internal politics. There were some who asked about his academic career. So his career was so long and so important and hit on so many issues that different people emphasize different parts of it. And I have to say, I, this is a good story about the media. I was impressed with the knowledge base that a lot of reporters had about Henry Kissinger. Well, they all had obituaries ready to go. And some of the obituaries have been, I mean, it's amazing journalism, how long and in-depth they are. It's like reading a short biography. Yep. And in this case, these obituaries have been written. As we all know, these obituaries are written many, many, many years ago, and then they're refreshed and they're updated to make sure that, you know, when they're published, they're ready. So, yeah. I, I think it was the New York Times that interviewed me nine years ago, I think. There you go. For Kissinger's obituary, the Washington Post, I think it was three years ago. And and the strange thing is when you're you're helping with an obituary for someone who's not dead, it's a really strange. I'm not sure as Jews were actually allowed to do that technically. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, also, sometimes reporters aren't around anymore by the time the obituary is finally published. But anyway, I know you've also written some columns. Matter of fact, you wrote one for CNN. And I think the way you wrote this is an explanation as to why you were contacted by so many different media outlets. You were not offering uh, utter condemnation, and you also weren't offering high praise and peons, as some of the uh, so-called ruling class or even some historians have, but that doesn't mean you were squishy in the middle without actually taking a position on anything. I think as a historian, right, you want to look at the entire picture when someone is as influential and important as this and not just condemn them. 
I think that's right. And I think Kissinger is the, the most difficult test for us because his career, as I've tried to explain, has some really great accomplishments, enduring accomplishments. I'm sure we'll talk about this, the opening to China. That's, of course, part of his work with President Nixon, but he gets part of the credit on that. Shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East. And there are a number of things, but there also are some abject failures that result in a great deal of suffering and enduring problems for the world and for American policy. If you think about the coups in Latin America, Vietnam and Cambodia, East Timor, Bangladesh. And the challenge for us as historians is, first of all, to understand a man who can be connected to such a wide range of issues, to understand how he operated. That's much of what I've written about. And then as individuals trying to judge. And of course, we're always judging the history that we study. How do we pass judgment on someone whose record is so mixed in the extreme? Very few figures range as far in their record as Henry Kissinger does. But also the structures that enable it, right? How was this one person able to exert so much influence? It has to do with the uh, structures of his office, ideology, the position of the United States at the time, right? And one of the key points of my book, Henry Kissinger, The American Century, is that a key structural factor were the unique conditions at the period for which he came of age, which is to say the effects of the Holocaust and World War II on American society and on America's place in the world. As I argue in my book, Henry Kissinger is unthinkable. 20 years earlier. He's a German Jewish immigrant to the United States at 15 who speaks no English, who within a few years is in an elite position in counterintelligence, reoccupying the country that he fled. And that gives him entree to policymaking and a whole new space, quite frankly, for emigre intellectuals who were never accepted in American society before to now become cosmopolitan distinguished figures influencing our politics, our policy, even our culture. You know, I remind people that in the early 1970s, Kissinger is a sex symbol. That's so strange for my students to think about today. I think he was People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive in 1972 or something like that. Oh, my. Yeah. There's hope for all of us, Martin. (laughs) Maybe next year for me. Um, About Kissinger, um, some may see him as an innovator or an original thinker, but in some ways he was orthodox. I mean, he was a cold warrior, right? He also subscribed to the big nuclear arsenal. He, He actually argued in favor of limited nuclear war earlier yep, in his yep. career. He did give up that position later on. Um, I mean, how, how do you view his him as an intellectual? Was he an original thinker? Is he overrated in that respect, or um, what do you... Well, I, I think he is a serious intellectual, but I also think he's largely synthetic in the way he thinks. He's not an original thinker in the sense of coming up with brand new theories and brand new ways of thinking about issues. But what he's very good at which is a key element of intellectual life, is taking the ideas of others seriously and reassembling them in different kinds of ways. So let's take the topic you already brought up, nuclear weapons and questions about limited nuclear weapons. In the 1950s, one of the big questions for many of the nuclear strategists, the people that Dr. Strangelove, that Stanley Kubrick makes fun of, (laughs) the bland corporation, as he called them, right? One of the questions is, how do you manage deterrence in a world where you have these big, big weapons But it's not credible that you're going to use them against every small incursion by the enemy. Uh, Kissinger takes from the game theory work that Daniel Ellsberg and Tom Schelling were doing. They were the original thinkers about this, but he then applies it to policy. And, And that's serious intellectual work. He's much more in the application and synthetic area. But I don't think we should discount that. Most policymakers don't have the seriousness, the time, or the depth to take ideas as seriously as Kissinger did. He was also a ruthless operator. Yes. And I think, as I try to explain in my book, I think that comes from his background in part. Um, He witnesses a society, a sophisticated democratic society, which he understood well at the age of 15, Weimar Germany. He witnesses it not only collapse, but succumb to the worst hatred and the worst violence. And he becomes convinced that power, grasping and using power, is essential for security as a Jew as a citizen, as a country in a dangerous world. And so he becomes obsessed with power. And I think that obsession with power comes from the trauma of deprivation uh, in the Holocaust. And if you read him, this is actually what he says, right? That the world is disorderly, it's Spenglerian in its descent into violence, and that it's only power that can assure order. And if you want order, you must have power. 
And stability, right? And if that yes. means trampling on democratic rights of well, people in certain parts of the world, then so be it. That's right. And, and I think there's a discomfort with mass politics. Kissinger is of the period when Hannah Arendt and others are writing about the dangers of mass politics, right? The Nazi regime and other fascist regime, regimes motivated and mobilized mass groups of people in rallies to go out and start wars and kill Jews. And that's something that's a kind of democracy populist democracy that Kissinger was always uncomfortable with. Uh, I'll tell one story. Sure. This was, I believe, 2008. I actually was at a dinner with Kissinger. I had just published my book, and we were doing an event. We did a few events together, and we were doing one in New York at the New York Historical Society, and there was a dinner afterwards. And uh, he was at a table. It was uh, Henry Kissinger, Nancy Kissinger, my wife and me, and Norman Podhoritz and his wife. And this was during the Democratic primaries. I said to, to Kissinger, I said, this, this Obama guy, you know, he's got large, enthusiastic crowds. I think he's pretty serious. And Kissinger said to me, well, those kinds of crowds are the kinds of crowds that damage our democracy. There wasn't any enthusiasm for Obama. It wasn't a racial comment he was making, Martin. He was making a comment about the fears that large crowds of enthusiastic people don't make good policy. Well, I could see why he would think that, given his background. And, well, he lost 12, at least, family members in the Holocaust. So. Including his maternal grandparents, who he was very close to. He used to visit them on many weekends outside of Furt. They were a wealthy, cattle-dealing family in the town of Leutershausen, which was uh, about 45 minutes by train from where he grew yeah. up in Furt, Germany. You know, I mentioned he was a cold warrior. I mean, you had to be if you're going to serve in U.S. government during those years. But he's also been called a realist or uh, an espouser of real politic rather than a values-based foreign policy. You know, when I when I think of these definitions, and then I look at the results, or you know, foreign policy is in the doing. We've seen both so-called realists and you know values-based ideologues execute disastrous policies. U.S. foreign policy, you know, yes, you yes. know, for instance, George W. Bush and the freedom agenda versus Kissinger's more cynical views of right of the world. Yeah, I, I think we have to get beyond this distinction. And I think your very right, righteous answer on this uh, of your own it captures this. Um, everyone is driven by values in one way or another. We, no one is valueless. A true realist would not actually think the United States is special. Find me a policymaker who doesn't think the United States is special. Find me an American who doesn't think the United States is special. Kissinger says this many times. He believes the United States is a savior nation, that the United States should have disproportionate power in the world so it can save the world from itself. And he believed that his role as one of the leaders of the United States was to conduct, to drive that train. That's a value judgment that a realist someone like George Kennan wouldn't buy into. George Kennan thought the United States might be worse than the rest of the world, not better than the rest of the world. Kissinger's real politique is, as you said, his willingness then, once that value judgment is firmly ensconced in his thinking, his willingness then to make all kinds of maneuvers that might violate other values in the pursuit of that value. So it becomes okay for Kissinger to cause innocent deaths, in the pursuit of what he sees as a greater purpose served by American order and what he thinks would be the preservation of more lives in the long term. Yeah, that's his justification for bombing a new, neutral country, Cambodia. We're going to get to Cambodia in a bit. So I mentioned at the top how some historians have simply condemned him. Greg Grandin is one. He wrote an obituary in The Nation magazine. Uh, Kissinger wasn't alone among post-war policy intellectuals in invoking the tragedy of human existence and the belief that the best one can hope for is to establish a world of order and rules. So this is Kissinger's dim view of human nature. Uh, he was an existentialist as well, according to Grandin. Uh, he goes on to say, George Kennan, a conservative, and Arthur Schlesinger, a liberal, both thought human nature's dark and tangled aspects, in Schlesinger's words, justified a strong military. The world needed policing. But both men and many others who shared their tragic sensibility eventually became critical, some extremely so, of American power. By 1957, Kennan was arguing for disengagement from the Cold War. And by 82, he was describing the Reagan administration as ignorant, unintelligent, complacent, and arrogant. The Vietnam War provoked Schlesinger to advocate stronger legislative power to rein in what in 1973 
he would call the imperial presidency. Not Kissinger, writes Grandin. Grandin says Kissinger fully embraced the imperial presidency and was a lawbreaker in the process. Well, it's worth pointing out that the examples Grandin gives of George Kennan and Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who become critical of U.S. policy, particularly in Vietnam, and in Kennan's case, critical of Reagan's policies, they're critical when they're out of power. Arthur Schlesinger never said a critical thing about Kennedy's policies when he was working for Kennedy, and Kennedy was responsible for increasing American activities in Vietnam, for example. So we should be careful about this. Kissinger always saw himself as an intellectual policy maker, not an intellectual critic. And really, with very few exceptions, he does not criticize policies made by the United States. He advocates for certain policies, but does not criticize them. Now, that has led people like Grandin to call Kissinger a kiss-up at times, a sycophant. And I think that's true, but that's how you become an influential policymaker. So that's a, that's a criticism of a particular professional role. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a really interesting moment, Martin, uh, after the bombing of Cambodia that I know we're going to get to in mid-1970, when uh, Kissinger's former colleagues from Harvard, Ernest May, Tom Schelling, I think Michael Walzer, come down and meet with him in the State Department. And they say to Kissinger, we have the transcript of this meeting, uh, Henry, you should resign. You should resign because of the crimes committed by this administration. And Kissinger listens and then says, uh, but if I resign, then what? <laughs> How can I influence things if I'm on the outside? I'm not saying Kissinger's right. But I am saying for someone, for a scholar sitting you know, in their comfortable office in New Haven <laughs> to say it's so easy to criticize policies you're trying to influence, that's not right. It's easy to criticize if you don't want influence. But if you want to have influence, how do you manage criticism and support? Maybe Kissinger didn't get the balance right, but let's acknowledge, Martin, that's a difficult thing to do. And he would say, those who criticize me have no idea of the awful choices I have in front of me. I'm not saying I agree with him, his justification, but that would be yeah. his defense. Right? You don't, Absolutely. You don't have the, the choices to make. I do. I'm in the role. You're not. And I do think Kissinger might have been self-serving in saying this, but I do think he believed that what he was doing was the best of the available alternatives. That doesn't make him free of guilt yeah. and free of criminality, but it is different from someone who is seeking to exploit the situation for their own personal gain. The thing about him that I find to be enigmatic, you know, we've talked about what drove him. He did like power, right? He wanted to be an operator, but, he, you know, he did believe in things. He did have values. But at the same time, he wasn't a crusading ideologue, right? So he wanted to shape the global environment. He wanted to assert U.S. hegemony. And some wonder, so why? But why? Right. And, and, and I think that's the key question. That's really why I started studying him 20 years ago and writing about him, because I think that's fascinating. He believed American hegemony would provide the best route for preventing another world war and allowing for prosperity and some degree of peace in a disorderly world, a world that he believed could easily careen back into the apocalypse he had lived. And he says this time and again. This is what he says repeatedly in the Middle East. One of the things that happens after the 73 war that we're still living with is the United States becomes the dominant external player in the Middle East, which also puts us in the target zone for everyone who's angry about policy there. And his argument is not that the United States has some utopian solution for the Middle East, but that we're the best possible mediator of all those that might be there. That's what he says to Mao Zedong also, that we're better than the Soviets. Wouldn't you rather have a partnership with us than the Soviets? So it's a belief in the essential role of American power in preventing the world from reliving apocalypses that he himself has witnessed. And in the process, his critics would say he put other people through an apocalypse. Um... I think that's the irony, and I agree with that. I think one of the lessons for us, I, I said this repeatedly in, in other interviews, and I think it's really important to think about this after his passing. How is it that sometimes we use power to prevent an outcome, but we make elements of that outcome we're trying to prevent more likely in the way we're using power, right? It's the unintended consequence of power. So I am not a international human rights lawyer or a war crimes prosecutor. I did do an episode in May, uh, Kissinger and Cambodia is the name of that episode. Yeah. Anyone wants to listen to that with Thomas Schwartz, who is a Kissinger biographer. We talked about the secret bombing of Cambodia. This is when Kissinger turned 100 years old. And in my view, it was a war crime. What Jesus. did Tom say? What did Tom say? 
you know, he says no. He says no to yeah. that, not a war crime. But this is what I want to talk to you about, Jeremy. The military wanted to bomb Cambodia for years. Nixon wanted to bomb Cambodia. Cambodia was neutral, but the North Vietnamese were violating its neutrality, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I'm not trying to minimize what Kissinger did in that episode. Uh, you know, he was lying about what the Air Force was up to. This was not an approved war, etc. But he was also working for someone. He was executing his boss's policies. And if we're going to, as a matter of history, properly assess culpability and responsibility, it belongs with Nixon, does it not? More so than Kissinger? Well, certainly, Richard Nixon was the president. And this is also an issue when we talk about China, because people often forget that Richard Nixon was instrumental in the opening to China as well. There can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. Uh, you've written this, Martin, and I think you're right. Uh, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, work with the president, and that president, for better or for worse, sets the guide rails. And in the case of Cambodia, it's clear the president was more rabid than Kissinger. Nonetheless, Kissinger was part of that decision. At that level, you have responsibility for the issues you carry forward, even if they are encouraged by your boss. Um, so I'm not sure that's the route out I would go. Mm -hmm. I think what I would say is that the bombing of Cambodia was, first of all, a horribly bad military decision. Uh, lying about it had enormous consequences within the United States. And I don't think it was a war crime as much as I think it was impeachable. And the president of the United States should have been impeached. It was brought up, wasn't that. it, as a, as a count in the impeachment against yes. Nixon, but dropped uh, for some reason? I, I think it was dropped because they thought the evidence on Watergate was, was more yeah. open and shut. Right? And then we had the uh, War Powers Resolution, too, that was supposed to rein in that type of like uh, unilateral war making by the executive. But Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I, you know, that, that's how I think that should be pursued. I think any president who undertakes military action of a warlike quality and lies to the American public has violated their oath to the Constitution. Kissinger never apologized for what happened in Cambodia. In fact, he would deny that many civilians were actually casualties in what happened there. He's lying. First, there was no carpet bombing. So that is absolutely not, uh, not true. At the end of his life, or throughout his life, he lied on many issues. That's one of the lies he told repeatedly. Another lie he told repeatedly was that uh, we could have saved South Vietnam if Congress had only appropriated more money after American forces withdrew. He knew that was not true. That's as right. well, it's created a whole myth that Congress was responsible for losing the war, not the president. There were a number of areas where he was dishonest, and he was dishonest because he was trying to protect his record. I, I confronted him a little bit with this when I wrote, wrote my book about him. I, I just think this is, this is who he was. He was afraid to admit mistake because if he admitted mistake, it is possible he would have been prosecuted, and he certainly would have lost his place as the great sage of American foreign policy. Andrew Basevich, who's the head of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and a great historian himself, wrote uh, in a symposium on Kissinger's uh, passing at ResponsibleStatecraft.org. I met Kissinger just once at a small gathering in New York back in the 90s. When the event adjourned, he walked over to where I was sitting and spoke to me. Did you serve in the military? Yes, I said. In Vietnam? Yes. His tone filled with sadness. He said, we really wanted to win that one. Basevich says, I did not reply, but as he walked away, I thought, what an accomplished liar. And, you know, for all the, the folks who praise him as this sage, right? Anyone who's familiar with the phony stage-managed piece of 1973 and the decent interval, right? So to Basevich's point that we really wanted to win that one. Nixon and Kissinger, we have it on tape, what they were saying prior to the 1972 election. We know, pretty much, I'm paraphrasing here, we know the war is lost. South Vietnam cannot survive without us, but we need a decent interval. So when it finally collapses, we don't take the blame for it. While thousands of people on both sides in the war are dying. So we've got to find some formula that holds the thing together a year or two. Afterwards, after a year, Mr. President, Vietnam will be a backwater. If we settle it later in October by January 74, no one will give a damn. His record is filled with those kinds of moments that are horrible, disgraceful, reprehensible, and also extraordinary accomplishments. To the end of his life, this man 
is trying to help the United States and China manage uh, the situation in the Taiwan Strait so we don't go to war. Of course, that's self-serving for him, but he also really believed that. So that's what makes judging Kissinger so hard. And that's why I am allergic to these simple headlines calling him war criminal or hero. He's neither of those things alone. They're that's elements right. of that. Yeah. But he's neither of those things alone. And, and gosh, Martin, our job as historians and as citizens is to see complexity because that's actually how we learn. And we want to understand why someone is so influential because we're still living with the consequences of some of what he did. For instance, you just said it, the opening to China. What's funny is maybe that hasn't worked out the way <laughs> people hoped it would. All the way into the 1990s, when you remember the Clinton administration was pushing for China to enter the World Trade Organization, bring it into the international community, and it would become a, a follower of the rules-based order. Now, you can we can debate as to whether China would eventually have become an economic powerhouse, even had it never joined the WTO. This agreement is a good deal for America. Our products will gain better access to China's market in every sector from agriculture to telecommunications to automobiles. But China gains no new market access to the United States, nothing beyond what it already has. In fact, we'll gain tough new safeguards against surges of imports and maintain the strongest possible rules against dumping products that have hurt Americans in the past. But we know what did happen. It, it joined that organization and it has proceeded to, well, not play by the, the rules of the, of the world economy all the time. Kind of rambling here, but Mano, what, what's your take on uh, the importance of that, that moment in the 1970s and, and where it's wound up today? Well, I do think the opening to China was absolutely crucial in transforming the world in ways that were very positive at that time. First of all, it created less of a U.S.-Soviet bipolar world. It gave the United States more leverage on the Soviet Union. It tempered Soviet behavior. It took away, strangely, the justification for the Vietnam War, right? If the Chinese were not the enemy in the same way, it opened trade possibilities. It opened possibilities for managing conflict. And for those who care about human rights, it set the stage for China to lift something like 100 million people out of poverty. Of course, the regime did not become more democratic. At times, it became a little more open. But it's still better than the alternative. Let's remember on the eve of Kissinger and Nixon's trips to China, China is still in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. It's a society convulsing itself and threatening its neighbors. And we go to a much more stable circumstance that I think contributes to the end of the Cold War. That's not what Kissinger intended, of course. Yeah. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of positive that comes from that. I think the real criticism of Kissinger's claims to greatness from the opening to China it's not to criticize the opening to China. It's to ask if it would have happened anyway. It was Mao's idea, right? It, yes, it was Mao's idea. Mao needed something after the yeah. terrible effects of the Cultural Revolution and the rising Soviet threat. China and the Soviet Union almost go to war in 69 on their long border. So those are the motivations Mao had. And Mao, Mao is a realist. We talked about realism before. Understood the, the most basic Chinese proverb, right? Use one set of barbarians against another set of barbarians. And that's what, that's what he was trying to do. So I think the real question is not, was the opening to China meaningful? Of course it was. But would it have happened with a President Humphrey and a uh, is Big New Brzezinski in that role? Probably yes. Huh. Well, it's impossible to imagine the modern world today without a U.S.-China relationship. As you said, it's, I mean, it's shaped our world today, right? It's maybe the most important relationship in the world today. Absolutely, Man. absolutely. Was Kissinger the most influential American political figure in the second half, or maybe even the entire 20th century, who wasn't a president? Yes. Many presidents were more influential. Presidents like Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan, but of unelected figures— and, and that's what's interesting about him as a political figure. He is a political figure in a democracy who takes on enormous power and enormous public influence, and he's never elected to office. And then the other thing to be said is even though at every point in his career there might be other figures who have more influence, his career is so long and his influence lasts so long. Here's an interesting point. My students, my undergraduates, before I teach them anything, know more about Kissinger than they, knew about, than they know about Jimmy Carter, and much more than they know about Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford could rise from the grave and walk into my classroom, and the students have no idea who that is. Henry Kissinger, they recognize his voice, they recognize his face. They don't know a lot about him, but his influence 
uh, really lasts, I mean, four to five decades after he's yeah. in power. Yeah, I want to get to that. Yeah, but when he was in power, well, he started off as more of like a consultant, right? A uh, Harvard intellectual. He doesn't enter any type of office until Nixon offers him the national security advisor job in 68. And then he becomes both the national security chief and the secretary of state at some point. But he's the only in, person to do both. The yeah. only person to do both. And then he's in power for about eight years. I mean, after Ford loses and Carter takes office in January of 77, Kissinger goes into private practice, right? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, he was a consultant, as you said, uh, for the actually a little bit for the Eisenhower administration, a little bit for the Kennedy administration, a little bit for the Johnson administration. And after he leaves office, he remains an influential public figure, but also a figure behind the scenes for pretty much every president in different ways. It's more personal with George W. Bush than it is with someone like Obama. But even during Obama's presidency, uh, Kissinger has frequent communications with uh, Hillary, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Obama severely criticized him in 2016 in an interview, saying we're still cleaning up the messes he caused literally and figuratively. He even talked about ordinance that never exploded yes. during uh, the Cambodia fiasco and that is still, I think Obama said, blowing off the legs of people. Yet Obama's secretary of state consulted that same man mm -hmm. when uh, trying to figure out how to manage relations with China. Kissinger is the embodiment of, of what? Why don't you fill in the answer Fill in the blank there. Well, he's the embodiment, I think, of the promise of American power and the hubristic tragedy of American power. Both of those things. I say his, his life is a parable of what's possible in America. Where else can a 15-year-old refugee who doesn't even speak your language rise to this level without ever getting elected to office, without any real wealth until after he's in power? Uh, but also, what other part of the world can someone with that power cause so many deaths and shake so many parts of the world? So it's, it's a Greek tragedy, but it's also a parable of Horatio Alger. It's both of those things yeah. together. You remember how Clinton, you mentioned Hillary Clinton, in a debate with Bernie Sanders. And this was to show that she had gravitas and she understood the world, that she you know, consulted with Henry Kissinger, was her friend. Bernie Sanders said, I'm very proud to say Henry Kissinger is not my friend for all the things that he did. <laughs> I will not take advice from Henry Kissinger. And in fact, Kissinger's actions in Cambodia, when the United States bombed that country, overthrew Prince Sihanouk, you know, created the instability for Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge to come in, who then butchered some three million innocent people, one of the worst genocides in the history of the world. So count me in as somebody who will not be listening to Henry Kissinger. I guess what I was trying to go there at the embodiment point is he's also, I don't want to call him a canvas, but that people project their own views on. But oh, yes. he, he means a lot to different people. And because his career lasted so long and he was so instrumental in so many major events, he does become representative of, well, the American century, American hegemony. Yes, and he becomes a totem pole in American politics uh, around foreign policy because he becomes seen by those who like him and hate him, both, as this monumental figure. And so if you want gravitas, you touch the totem pole. You show that you are worthy. Sarah Palin, when she was running for vice president, went and met with him. Hillary Clinton, as you already said, connected yeah. herself. Donald Trump tried to associate himself with Henry Kissinger. John McCain associates. He's a totem pole that tells people, I'm a serious person on foreign policy because I've gone to the mountain and I've touched yeah. the man at the top of the mountain. But that's what irks, you know, the Greg Grandins and others who don't like Kissinger. You know, why are we still fetting this man? Why are we still consulting him for information after everything he's done? And that's a legitimate, it's a legitimate point. I, I think that's right. And I think there is a fair argument that Americans relied on Kissinger for too long and that many journalists like talking to Kissinger just as policymakers do because he would give thoughtful answers and full paragraphs that were easy to quote. And so, you know, there's a lot in what Grandin is saying, but there's also something in what Grandin is saying and others that it just misunderstands policy. Policy is not about having the best ideas. Policy is about having actionable ideas. And that was Kissinger's strength, his ability to take complex issues and offer policymakers in a relatively short space of time ways of acting. Policymakers don't want academics like me to come and tell them why everything they're doing is wrong and why there's no good option. Right? You ask me about what should be done in the Middle East today, I'll tell you there's no good option. 
That is not helpful for a policymaker. It's true, but it's not helpful. What they want is someone like Kissinger who understands the issues and says, okay, here are some things you can do to advance American national interests. And I will tell you more than anything else, that's why people rely on him. That's why business leaders would look to him. He offers actionable knowledge. And too many academics, quite frankly, don't understand that, and they're jealous of it. And when it comes to the war criminal allegation, that can be leveled at a lot of American leaders. And I say that as an American citizen. And I don't say that blind to the, the criminality perpetrated by other countries either. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, that's the, that's the problem. I, I do think there's a persuasive argument that many have made. And again, I'm not a lawyer either, but I believe there are a number of cases where Kissinger's actions constitute war crimes. But I'm concerned if we label him a war criminal, almost every American policymaker. We've got to put Brzezinski, Rice, Powell, probably Obama and Clinton in exactly that same category. So we'll wrap up with this, Jeremy Surrey. Where does his influence still manifest itself? Can you point to anything, say, that the Biden administration is doing that? Oh, that's Kissingerian. (laughs) Absolutely. In the days and weeks after the horrible, despicable, reprehensible Hamas attack on Israel— The Biden administration and Secretary of State Tony Blinken began uh, shuttle diplomacy again. And they self-consciously went back to Kissinger's model, not because they thought everything he did was correct, but they needed some way to mediate and some way to prevent this war that was emerging from exploding into a larger regional conflagration. And Kissinger was the last president to manage a similar situation. And when Kissinger died, Secretary of State Blinken said this. He said he was the he was the standard that guided us, particularly in this region. Secretary Kissinger really set the standard for everyone who followed uh, in um, in this job. I was very privileged to uh, get his counsel uh, many times, including as recently as uh, about a month ago. Uh, he was extraordinarily generous uh, with his wisdom, with his advice. Uh, few people. Uh, were better students of history, even fewer people did more to shape history than Henry Kissinger. Jeremy Surrey, historian at the University of Texas at Austin, author of Henry Kissinger and the American Century, host of This Is Democracy podcast. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to return to the Middle East, which could use some shuttle diplomacy these days. War has resumed between Israel and Gaza. We're going to look at parallels between this war and the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. It failed. Will Israel's war today fail? That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 